Uh, welcome to tonight's show. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about personal injury cases and specifically car accident cases. What you do to have to win, what can cause you to lose, and if you do win, what you're entitled to recover. There's a lot of misunderstanding about these cases, but we want to talk a little bit about it. I hope we don't get too legalese with you or too much like a law school. But uh, this is something that most people have in their lifetime more than one time, unfortunately. The first thing I want to, we want to talk about is when you have a car accident, do you need a lawyer? Freeman, what would you say? I would say it's always best to consult a lawyer, but a lot of times you won't need one depending on uh, what we'll talk about later is damages. And, you know, if you, if you don't have any injuries and you're happy with what they've offered to fix your car or to replace the car, uh, then a lot of times you won't need one. Uh, I will say that it's always best to consult with a lawyer just to make sure uh, that you can't get a little bit more for your car or if you do have some slight injuries. But, you know, for the most part, I don't think you always need one, but it's always best to consult. Well, one. along that line, let me ask you about this. Let's, before we get into talking about how those cases are won or lost, <clears throat> if you have a property damage only, no personal injury, can you get loss of value for the car? You can. Uh, if you are hit by another person, typically you're not going to get it. If you are in a single car accident or if you cause the accident, you're not going to get it for your car. But if you're in an accident that someone else created, someone hits you or someone ran you off the road, uh, and then you will be able to uh, recover loss of value, which is basically going to be uh, like you'd think it would be. It'll be the value of your car. Uh, before the accident occurred and the value after because as we all know uh, after a car has been wrecked then it definitely loses value so it's really uh, the claim is basically the loss of value caused by the accident even after you get the car repaired that's correct so you may cost you two thousand dollars to get a car repaired or ten thousand but you also it's going to be worth less because people don't, don't want to buy a wrecked car certainly and if you have a new car you might have a, a situation where you might only have $500 worth of damages to the car, but the car is, is relatively expensive since it's new. So the loss of value could be a, a few thousand dollars simply because the value of the car, if you're starting high, mm -hmm. is going to come down more. And uh, the, a lot of times the insurance adjusters won't tell you about that that possible claim. And that's also why it's best to always yeah. consult a lawyer because their job is always going to be to settle for the least amount of money possible, whether it's uh, a claim for your property damage or for your personal injury, and they're not going to tell you about now, everything you can recover. How do you prove loss of value? What do you do? Uh, the easiest way to do it is to take, uh, take your car, you know, where you bought it maybe, if you bought it from a dealer, have the dealer uh, you know, write you a letter telling you what it was worth when the accident, before the accident occurred, and what it's worth now. And if, you know, the insurance company needs more detail than that, uh, then most of the time the, the dealer can provide well, that detail. I, I think that's right, but I think what you want to do is have the dealer focus on just the loss of value component, because the ordinary manage of loss, a measure of damages is the, may, the value before the accident, the value after the accident. So you get that value, and that should be what it's going to cost you to fix it. But then you've lost some value uh, because you can't sell it for what it's worth now, and that's because of the accident. So it's a, it's a particular focus that you want to get into. And the way you do that, you get some proof of that from uh, uh, somebody in the business who knows something about values of cars. All right, <clears throat> now, uh, just, you're talking about when you need a lawyer and when you don't. I recently had somebody come see me and they were they had no personal injury uh they weren't hurt didn't lose anything didn't didn't get didn't get a upset stomach or anything else it was all property damage and they were arguing over whether the car was worth and i'm going to use the hypothetical numbers sixty five hundred dollars or seventy five hundred dollars now the thousand dollar difference is that worth hiring a lawyer over not really but you ought to get his as freeman said you ought to get his advice on how to get that number where you want it to go but you, you can't pay a lawyer and come out on top on a small case like that. 
So what we really focus on is cases where there are serious personal injuries. That's where a lawyer makes his way, makes his money, and, and mm -hmm. it's worth it when that happens. And the reason that when we get to the, toward the end of the show is you'll understand that some of these components of damages you're entitled to don't have a, a, a way to calculate them. They're left up to the discretion of a jury as to how much they are. And so that's why uh, when you get serious personal injury, like pain and suffering or a loss of earnings can be a calculable number, or mental anguish is not, all these things uh, are what you're really trying to show are worth a lot of money or not. Maybe they're not, but in some cases they really are. And it's how you do that that's important when you hire a lawyer. So uh, we'll come back to that subject in a minute when we talk about damages. Now let's talk about how you prove whether or not you're entitled to recover. That is where the other driver, we're talking about accidents where there are two cars involved, at least two, uh, not where you hit a telephone pole or ran off the road and hit a tree because you're not, you nobody to recover against it. There, you did it. So when there are two cars involved and you've been hit by somebody and you've been seriously injured, what do you have to prove to recover? Freeman, we're talking about that. I, I, that. I'm going to jump jump back to that in a second, but I okay. want to make one one other point. Uh, you don't have to be seriously injured. It can appear that it's a minor mm -hmm. injury. And one thing that, that, uh, that you'll always see in these kind of cases is that the insurance company will try to get you to settle quickly. And a lot of times that's because mm -hmm. you won't know what you, the extent of your injury is for, you know, sometimes months. So you may take a settlement quickly and then find out two or three months later that your injury is much worse because you didn't go to the necessary doctors to make sure you weren't weren't hurt, you didn't have an MRI done. And the injury can actually, especially with neck and back injuries, can actually surface later on that are caused by the accident. Well, but you won't know the extent of them until later. And there's another reason to wait until you've, until you've gotten all the facts. Well, we recently have a case going on right now where somebody was hurt, not seriously, but in, an, in a truck car accident. And we waited about nine or 10 months to determine about the facts about the driver. We found out that the driver of this truck was on methamphetamines. Now that raises the specter in the case tremendously when that happens. It was just an ordinary negligence case where somebody just goofed up. That's one number, but when you get somebody who's grown, grown across the line with drugs or high speed or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, that raises the value significantly. So sometimes it's best to wait and not get in a hurry. Uh, and I might also mention for the uh, audience, uh, there, these cases are always governed by what we call statute of limitations. And depending on the type of case, they may have different time limits. Freeman, explain what statute of limitation is and what it does to the case. Well, in, in this particular, what we're talking about tonight, the statute of limitations on, the, on a car accident would be two years. So from the day the car accident happens, you have two years to file a lawsuit uh, you know, against the other driver or whoever caused the accident. And if you don't do it, what happens? If you don't do it, you can't do it. You're, you're finished. You're locked out, aren't you? Other kinds of cases like trespass are as long as six years. Anyway, you have to be sure that you've complied with the statute of limitations or you'll be thrown out of court. And you know, okay. another reason is once you've taken money, you, you don't get to do it again. That's so right. if you you're settle done. early and you've realized you're later out. you're hurt, you're out of luck. Okay. We'll continue with this discussion at, at the break. Well, after the break is over, we'll talk more about it. Be back in a second. All right, thank you for staying around and uh, coming back with us in this second segment. <clears throat> the second segment, we're going to talk about what we have to prove as lawyers to win the case and what can keep us from winning, because both of that's true here, especially in Alabama, and I'll explain that in a minute. But let's, if you'll put the graphic up, I want to talk about the things that we have to prove in order to win. Uh, Freeman, take these on one by one, if you would. The, the elements of a negligence case are up on the screen now. And they're, uh, obviously, one is duty, uh, two is breach of duty, three is proximate cause, and four is damages. All right, let's take up with duty. When you say duty, what do you mean? What kind of duty are we talking well, about? Well, specifically tonight, there's all kinds of different uh, duties that you can owe to another person. In a car. Uh, but the ones tonight, we're going to only be talking about car uh, specifically car accidents. You, you know, as a driver, you have a duty to other drivers to operate your vehicle 
with uh, reasonable and ordinary care. Um, you know, that would include not speeding, not running red lights, uh, uh, for, for following example, the rules for, of the road. Let me ask you this question. If you're driving your car at 70 miles an hour, is that, is that negligence to do that? Well, it depends on where you are. That's exactly right. So if you're in a 15 mile an hour speeding zone limit, then that's clearly at least negligence is not worse. But if you're on an interstate where the speed limit is 70, that's not negligence. That's correct. You haven't done breached a duty to anybody that you can be held responsible. Also, I want to mention in the duty er area, uh, we have in Alabama what's called what we call rules of the road. These are rules that the legislature enacted years ago that prescribe your duty as a driver of a car and what you have to do to comply with the law. That if you don't breach one of these rules of the road and you don't do them, two things can happen. You can get a ticket, and you already know about that. Speeding is one of them. You can also be sued and held civilly liable for breaching uh, one of these rules of the road. The, mo the newest one of these rules of the road is called the move over. You probably know what I'm talking about, but if you're on the interstate, particularly, and you see a state trooper with somebody pulled over, and you're on a four-lane highway, you have a legal obligation to move over to the, uh, the farthest lane from where he's parked, whether that be on the right or left, and to stay there until you safely pass him. So if you don't do that, you can get a ticket for that, and you can also, suppose you hit the trooper, or hurt, or hurt somebody, or seriously injured, you can also be sued and held civilly liable for that. Uh, and there are a lot of other rules, like which side of the road you drive on, and so on. There's 60 or 70 of them. We're not going to go all, all of them tonight. Uh, we may save that for another show about what rules you have to follow. So that's another basis, though, for liability is you as a driver of your automobile. So um, what happens now when you sue, uh, if you can't resolve your case, and you, we always try to resolve them if we can, and not have to file a lawsuit, but if you have to file a lawsuit, and once you uh, allege and prove that somebody's breached this duty to the other driver, what can the other driver say in response to that, try to defeat your claim? Well, I, I think first we got to prove that, you, that there is a duty. Yeah. Uh, and then once we've shown that there is a duty, we have to show that that duty has been breached uh, by a driver by speeding or running a red light and hitting someone, whatever that may be. Uh, and that breaching of that duty was the reason that the, you or your car is damaged or you're hurt, injured as a person. And, you know, in law school, what we called this was but for. You know, without this happening, uh, you know, this person running the red light, then uh, I wouldn't be injured or my car wouldn't be dented <clears throat> uh, or what have you. And once you show that, that it's the proximate cause of your injuries, that it, those injuries wouldn't have happened without someone breaching the duty, then you can go into damages, you know, and we'll talk about that okay. later on. Let's go into what the other driver can say in response to your claim. Can they say that you were also negligent? Yeah, we can, we, now that we're back to that, uh, yes. You know, if, you, if you're acting in a negligent way as well, if you're speeding, if you're texting, if you're, you know, driving under the influence, then uh, in this state it's called contributory negligence and that can make it to where you, you know you can be uh, you can't collect on your claim. Right and, and it's something else about contributory negligence in Alabama it's an absolute defense unlike uh, some other states in other words if we prove that the other driver was negligent and they prove that you were contributory negligence that's an absolute bar to your claim and you lose. Now there's a way around that, that I'm going to discuss in a minute but some states allow you to proportion the wrongdoing between the two drivers. Mm -hmm. For example, and I, some states do it, I don't know whether Georgia does or not, but let's just say that the jury decides that the plaintiff is 60% responsible and that the defendant is 40% responsible. That means, and the damages are $10,000, it means that the plaintiff will only recover 6000 so that's how it works. In Alabama, it's an absolute defense. It doesn't matter who's most at fault or least at fault. If the defense is affirmative defense is contributory, you can't recover. Now, there is a way around that I mentioned. It's called subsequent negligence or last clear chance. And it means this. If the plaintiff proves that you're negligent and the defendant proves that the plaintiff who brought the suit is contributory negligence, 
then you can go back and say, look, the defendant knew I was in danger. And when he knew I was in danger, he didn't do anything to avoid it, and he could have. That's called subsequent negligence. So you bring him right back into the picture, and you can still win if you can show that in a case like that. So uh, that's one way around it. Now, uh, would you put that chart back up on the screen again, please, uh, about the elements of, of duty and so forth? Have you got that? All right. And <clears throat> so, as Freeman was saying, you prove that there's a duty owed. And, and by the way, some of these duties are, are involve the requirement that a driver keep a lookout. Um, and I used that one time in a case to win, even though I thought I was going to lose. And what we did was a lady was coming down Quintard, obeying the law, had the traffic light within the speed limit, but she failed to keep a lookout. Had she looked over to her left, she would have seen the, a young driver coming across the highway and could have had time to avoid it and didn't. So because of that, even though the lady was running a red light, she won, she won the case because the plaintiff did not keep a lookout. So just when you are going down the highway, don't think you can just be blind to what's going on on your right and left. You have a duty to keep a lookout, look around your surroundings and know what's going on, or you might be in real trouble. Now on the, on the proximate cause, that Freeman is just, uh, how would you explain that? I, but for, like I said earlier, that, that without this person's negligence, you wouldn't be injured or you wouldn't be damaged. All right. So in the next segment, we'll talk about damages, what you can recover. Thanks for staying tuned, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm glad that you stayed around because now we get to the most, one of the most important segments of personal injury cases, and we're talking tonight about car accident cases. Now you've gone to court, you couldn't settle your case, and you proved that the defendant breached a duty, that that caused the accident, and that that resulted in damages to you. We get asked all the time, you know, what are we entitled to recover if we do all those things? And you're entitled to recover first property damage loss. You know, the loss of, we talked about earlier, you've got damages to your vehicle. So you're entitled to get it repaired and recover a loss for that. If it's a total loss, you can also, you, you get uh, the whole car. If it's not a total loss, you can get loss of, of uh, value for it as well as your uh, repair cost estimates. And if you have to buy a rental car, use a rental car, you can also add that in. So those, those part of the damage claims are usually pretty simple. Now the other part of the damage claim is what we call uh, compensatory for personal injuries, personal injuries that you may have suffered. And if you would put that next chart up, we'll kind of go over those with you. And these are not all of them, but these are some of the basic ones. Um, I, yeah, you got four of them. There got to be, uh, well, how many are there, five or six? Okay, let's, let's talk about the first four. Freeman, let's talk about the, the main element of damages in a personal injury case, car accident case, and tell us how they're measured if there is a way. Uh, well, uh, the first one on this list is physical pain and mental anguish. Uh, I would say the, the main, uh, on a personal injury case, you're usually going to use the first and foremost, uh, the amount of medical bills to base what you think a case is worth. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that will get into physical pain and, and anguish because of the amount of times you may have to have a procedure done or go to the doctor or have surgeries or whatever it may be. Well, when physical pain, um, is there a way to measure that? No. So it's whatever the person has suffered and the way they explain it and uh, how much value a jury just puts, puts a value on it. That's there. right. Some, some injuries will, will hurt peop other people more than, you know, than some. Uh, some you get over with quickly, some last a while. If you ever had a back injury or a neck injury, they're going to be around a while. If you had a little abrasion or a scrape or something, that's going to clear up pretty quickly. But all of them cause pain. Some of them are worse than others. And you have to have your witnesses explain the depth of their pain. And you can do that through their doctor, can't you? You can. How would you do that? Well, I, I think we've discussed this in other show. Uh, Here we have. But to me, if you're going to get into a situation where you might have some, some, uh, some pretty good damages, it's always good to take the doctor's deposition and videotape it if you can. Uh, so that way the jury can see the doctor talk about it and you can ask him, you know, with this injury, 
would this cause a great deal of pain? And the reason to videotape it is because the doctor doesn't normally come to trial. That's correct. And if he does, he costs you a lot of money to come there, so we'll just videotape it. All right. Um, it costs a lot of money to depose him as well. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do that, though. All right, talk, let's talk about mental anguish. What in the world is mental anguish? Uh, that's, you know, probably, I guess, around here is somewhat controversial. Uh, that's going to be completely subjective because uh, it's going to be, you know, what you went through mentally, uh, how it affected you. Did it keep you up at night? Did it keep you, were you worried about what was going on? Could Just you how, eat? Could you yeah. sleep? How are you mentally affected? And how do you prove that? And you're going to prove it by your testimony, by people that are around you. Uh, you know, if you're married, your wife can testify to it. Whoever's around you, maybe your employer uh, can testify. What about a psychologist? Absolutely. You can always go see a psychologist and have and, them and doesn't, issue doesn't a report as well. Some, doesn't that lend some strength to your case when somebody is seeing a psychologist? It does. If you if you've claim you've been damaged mentally by something, but you haven't sought help in any way, Okay. then obviously it, it doesn't make it look like right. that's a real damage. Let's go to number two, mental language, zone of danger. Explain that. Uh, zone of danger is going to be a little different. Um, that can be applied uh, in different, different ways. For instance, if you are uh, you know, watching your kid play in the yard and you watch them get hit, uh, hit by a car, then the person, the parent who watches their child get hit can also recover for damages from mental anguish under zone of danger. And, and zone of danger really means that you're in a foreseeable area where somebody could anticipate, reasonably anticipate that you could be hurt by this. If you're two miles away, clearly that's not within the zone of danger. That's right. But you're 30 or 40 away from the, away from the roadway, uh, that's within the zone of danger. Sometimes you have to figure out where that is. All right, let's go to the third thing, and that's permanent injuries or disfigurement. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, permanent injuries are going to be uh, the, the most expensive for an insurance company. Uh, those are obviously injuries that are going to be permanent, you know, a, an injury that's not going to go away, a back problem that it is, you're going to have for the rest of your life, or it can be much worse than that. It can be, you know, you can lose and, a limb. And let's talk a minute about this, just a second about this. We recently had a case where a young girl had a scar, permanent scar on her face, of, on her forehead actually. Is that worth more to a young girl than it is to a young boy? Absolutely. Why? Uh, it's worth more to a young girl because obviously girls care, or at least for the most part, I would say, care more about their looks okay. and they're going to be more important to them. They do different things that, you know, they can be in pageants. And, and those can bring big money, can't they? They can. Yeah, permanent injury. All right, let's talk about uh, aggravation of a pre existing injury. Can that, it has another element of something you can recover for? Absolutely. You know, For example, let me ask you, if you had a back injury and you were pretty well with it and you had another accident and it made it worse, is that an element of your damages? Yes. All right. Um, now, you're also entitled to recover for your medical expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, and would that be the ones that were reasonably necessary to treat you? Yes. Okay. So you can recover for that. What if you lost a job because of it or you were out of work for some period of time? Can you recover for that? Lost yes. earnings. If you, if you uh, miss work, you know, you're going to be able to recover for, for that time that you missed based off of your salary or your hourly wage. Okay. Uh, we, can, we can go on with it. All right, let's go on with, uh, suppose you have a case in which you can claim punitive damages. Briefly explain what punitive damages are and what you can recover. Well, punitive damages are there to punish someone for bad behavior. So if, uh, you know, if you're driving drunk, then it can be considered what's called willful and wanton behavior. It's, a, it's, a, it's worse behavior than if you're simple negligence. That's right. You've, it's almost like you intended to hurt somebody. Almost. Or don't care. You're reckless. You're reckless. And you can cover, the jury can give you punitive damages. And how much punitive damage can they give you? Is there a measure for that? Uh, there is measures, but there's not an absolute statutory measure. So it's place. up to the jury. It, it is absolutely up to the but jury. But it can be a big component of damages. Anyway, that really concludes our general discussion of automobile accident cases. We'll have future sh shows dealing with other types of personal injury claims. I hope you'll stay tuned. We're on every Wednesday night at 930 and a certain other time. So we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening.